Welcome to the third meeting of criminal law. Our subject is the definition of criminal offenses. Criminal offenses are defined as sets of elements. Let's dive into our next case. Martin versus State. Martin appeals from his conviction for an offense we can call public drunkenness for short. His appeal is successful. This might surprise us. There's no real doubt that Martin was rowdy drunk in public. To understand what's going on, we have to look at the statute under which Martin was charged. We use shorthand at our peril. To find the law, we have to sift the language of the statute. The statute says, any person who, while intoxicated or drunk, appears in any public place where one or more persons are present and manifests a drunken condition by boisterous or indecent conduct or loud and profane discourse shall, on conviction, be fined. Well, Martin was drunk in a public place, others were present, and he does not deny that he boisterously or indecently manifested his drunkenness. Why should his conviction not be affirmed? Martin argues that the prosecution failed to prove a voluntary act on his part. The Supreme Court of Alabama agrees. It writes, Under the plain terms of this statute, a voluntary appearance is presupposed. Well, I don't see the word voluntary in the statute at all. Do you? Look again. Any person who, etc., etc., blah, blah, shall on conviction be fined. No voluntary. The court reads it into the statute. The court is drawing on a principle so well established that the court understands the legislature to have assumed that the court would fill out the words of the statute to include the word voluntary. This principle goes by the Latin phrase actus reus, which we can translate as the act thing, or maybe better, the voluntary act requirement. The court immediately goes on to say, an accusation of drunkenness in a designated public place cannot be established by proof that the accused, while in an intoxicated condition, was involuntarily and forcibly carried to that place by the arresting officer. So the court reads the statute as requiring the prosecution to show that the defendant committed two voluntary acts, that he appeared and that he manifested. Martin manifested his drunkenness voluntarily, but he did not appear in a public place voluntary. The evidence shows that the police arrested him, took him, and forcibly carried him into the street. The picture we get is something like this. Martin might not have been putting up this much of a fight, but the court does state that Martin was not only arrested and led into the street, but that the arresting officers forcibly carried him there. What we need to understand is what it takes to show that the defendant voluntarily performed the act forbidden by the statute. We need to know what the word voluntary means in the Voluntary Act requirement. Consider the following hypotheticals. Suppose that before the officers laid hands on Martin, a sudden gust of wind had lifted Martin into the air and blown him into the street. Martin then voluntarily manifested his drunkenness by cursing. Would his conviction under the Alabama statute be upheld? The answer is that in hypothetical number one, his appearance in the street is not a voluntary act. Now consider a second hypothetical variation. Mrs. Martin chases Mr. Martin into the street with a kitchen knife. As before, 
He curses drunkenly once he is in the street. Convictable? The answer in hypothetical two is that Martin is convictable. Martin may not want to be in the street, but he got there under his own power. Now consider a different scenario. In the third hypothetical, the drunken defendant is in a bar and is threatened by the bouncer with bodily ejection. Rather than be thrown out, the defendant walks into the street and cusses out the bouncer. In hypothetical number three, the defendant is convictable. This is essentially the same case as hypothetical number two, with the bouncer taking the place of Mrs. Martin. Again, it doesn't matter that the defendant would rather have stayed inside. Finally, let's vary hypothetical three. The defendant will not leave, and so the bouncer picks him up and throws him into the street. Is the defendant convictable under the Alabama statute? He is not. As far as the voluntariness of the defendant's appearance in the street goes, this case is like the first hypothetical. And like the facts in Martin, the only difference is in who is doing the carrying. The defendant does not appear in the street under his own power. As used in the criminal law, the concept of voluntariness does not depend on what the actor wants, but rather on what caused his body to move. This is in line with the way the concept has been understood since Greek antiquity. As the philosopher Aristotle put the point, the man acts voluntarily when the power that moves his limbs is within him, and thus it is due to him that the act is done. We do all kinds of things voluntarily, even though we don't want to do them. And even things we do under compulsion are voluntary too, if the power that moves our limbs originates inside of us. As the eminent Victorian jurist James Fitzjames Stephen wrote, a criminal walking to execution is under compulsion if any man can be said to be so. But his motions are just as much voluntary as if he were going to leave his place of confinement and regain his liberty. He walks to his death because he prefers it to being carried. Martin, evidently, preferred being carried to walking. His appearance in the street was involuntary. Our takeaway is that a voluntary act mustn't be confused with an act the actor wishes, wants, or desires. The voluntary act requirement therefore sets a low threshold of proof in the overwhelming bulk of cases.